It's Saturday. You know what that means. It's time for Wrestling with Wrestling's Past and Present. I'm Tim Kurt. I'm Roland Fulis. And I'm Mongo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, before we get into today's topic, we should uh, welcome back Roland. Roland is making his return to the show, so we're glad to have I'm, you back. Uh, we certainly missed you. I'm pretty excited to be back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I am back. So thanks, uh, thanks, Eric Bischoff, for that one. But uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you, Mongo, for holding it down while I was gone. I had a, um, some health issues, so um, it was great that you were able to step in and uh, team up with Tim. And uh, I think that I like the three man thing going forward. So if you're cool with you know joining us full time, I'm I'm cool with that. If that's what you're into. Yeah, absolutely. I had a lot of fun, you know, under, you know, I wish it was under better circumstances that I was filling in, but, you know, definitely honored to do it. And I love this, you know, it's three of us talking wrestling. How better can you get? With the challenge is going to be keeping our shows to 30 minutes or less. That's going to be a challenge, but we'll, <laughs> we can, I guess. So we're going to get into today's topic. Um, we called an audible uh, this week uh, due to the unfortunate passing of John Huber, Brody Lee. Um, so we, you know, all of the three of us kind of got together and felt like, it, you know, it was best to call an audible and, you know, dedicate this show to him. So we're going to talk about the life and career of uh, John Huber today. And I mean, to be fair, we're not going to be able to be anywhere near what uh, AEW did for him. Uh, I think we were all in agreement. That show was amazing. Um, if you got through that show with dry eyes, you are going to hell. I'm just yeah. <laughs> Do you, you, have, you have, a soul? have no soul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. You have no soul. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, I've been an EW fan from the beginning, like most of us. And, you know, we've gone through the Eddie tributes. We've gone through, you know, even the Chris Benoit tribute. We've gone through all the tribute shows. That was probably one of the top ones, tearjerker, heartwarming. I mean, just they got his kids involved and they showed the real person. And that's what made it hard was they showed you the person behind the gimmick. And that's what killed you more was, damn, we really lost a good one. Well, and that was what I read something the other day about like criticizing that they had like Brody Lee involved, like Brody Lee Jr. involved and they had him out on the, on the, it's like, A, he was already involved and B, this is how he's grieving with it. So like, don't criticize, like if he didn't want to be there or his mother didn't think he should be there, he wouldn't have been there. Yeah. So it, it you know, I, I read something about, I mean, you know, Bruce Mitchell got himself in trouble for saying some stuff too about, you know, the, the chance that, that it might've been COVID and they're covering something up or whatever. And, um, you know, he got let go from his job for, you know, 30 plus years, uh, writing for one of the dirt sheets. And, uh, it's too bad. There's people out there that try to capitalize on misfortune like that. Um, I, I think it's a real piece of shit move to, to even, you know, criticize anybody that, you know, had lost their family, any family member, the way that that happened. I mean, and, and the best part and worst part is that nobody knew. So that, I mean, that's what made it worse for a lot of the fans and some of, some of the wrestlers that weren't in AEW, um, they didn't know how sick he really was. Um, they, they kept this close to the vest and, and that's what made it so hard. Nobody saw it coming. And I mean, I remember when, I remember when Mongo texted me, well, I texted both of us in our group text and was like, dude, Brody Lee died. What? Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. I had the same I, reaction. It's just, it's shocking. Like you just, it's, you don't expect it. And he's only 41 years old and a family of two kids and a wife. And you just, I think we get so wrapped up into wrestling that we forget that they're actually human beings that are yep. main characters. And when, and you're just crushed when one of them dies. Uh, well, especially like this, where it's, where it's totally unexpected. And like I said, we didn't, we had no idea he was even sick. Mm -hmm. and, and I think but, that's what it was. It was just, it was something simple. I was either scrolling Instagram, you know, just doing something. And then I saw the AEW uh, place card where it showed it. And I was like, what? Like it didn't resonate at first. It, it almost reminds me of when I first heard Eddie died. I was like, no, like this is a rib. You're pulling my leg. Like, no, this is a horrible story. And then it just, it sinks in. And my first reaction was just to text you guys. Cause I'm like, please tell me I'm the only one who's heard of this. This can't be real. Like at that time you were, I had no idea. Yeah. As soon as you sent me that text, I looked it up myself. I was like, Oh man, like, this is actually, this is a real thing. What the hell? And I didn't have any other words. I didn't want to be like, dude, he's dead. Or cause I'm like, I, it was yeah. like, you said shot. Cause no one knew. And yeah, uh, it was, then it was seeing, his, seeing his wife post it that it was, a, you know, and we now find out that it was double lung failure. It's like, but he was an athlete. Like, like Tim said, you forget the wrestlers behind the gimmicks. You forget all that. And it's just, it doesn't seem real. And because we didn't know he was sick, 
it came as more of a shock, you know, and that, and that bandaid came off. You were like, what? Yeah. Well, and like I said, literally your message was guys, Brody Lee died that, that four, four words. Like what, what else are you supposed to say to that? Tim, Tim responded with what? And I literally responded with WTF. I was like, what? Like, I don't, you know, and that sums up this whole situation. Um, and we're not even related to the guy. And we, we, you know, we don't, we don't actually know him other than, other than his character. And, um, that's how, you know, you can call a lot of us marks and whatnot, but that explains how invested a really good fan is to the business for somebody to be in, impacted by someone in their prime unexpectedly passing away. Yeah, and someone who, you know, finally just started getting momentum as a single wrestler that they never really got before, as you know, we're going to kind of do a little deep dive into. Finally, gets that singles push. Finally, gets to be the leader instead of the follower. Yep, exactly. 100%. So we're going to do the best we can to, you know, cover his career here. I mean, um, you know, we, we can't obviously cover it all, but we're going to, you know, briefly kind of skim through his, his beginnings and, uh, and we'll get lead up to WWE and then his AEW career. Um, so let's get, let's get started. Uh, he's from Rochester, New York. Um, and he started in 2003 working on the independent scene under the Brody Lee name. So he kind of had that name from the very beginning. Uh, yeah, he had, he had started off as like Uber Boy number two, and then he went on to some other crappy name, and then he landed on the Brody Lee one. It, it was um, – they had that like like Mongo was talking about earlier. I know he did the podcast, but that uh, formerly known as uh, the WWE put out a couple years ago actually touches on that a little bit. So, but yeah, like you said, Bro- Brody Lee, him going back to Brody Lee from WWE after he left, that was a name he already established on the Indies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, he, he was in promotions like, uh, I believe it's pronounced Chikara. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, Chikara, uh, Squared Circle Wrestling. He was in Ring of Honor for a little bit, uh, Dragon Gate USA. Uh, and then Dragon Gate in Japan. Um, he was, you know, he formed a couple of teams with, you know, he had uh, in Chikara, he wrestled uh, Claudio Castanoli, which is Cesaro. Yeah. Um, let's see what yeah. else. He, yeah, he, he wrestled with Austin Aries. He had wrestled Necro the Butcher, uh, a lot with Eddie Kingston, who's currently signed to AEW. Um, pretty much who's who on the independent he was he was he rose up with yeah uh, Brian not, Daniels, not that this is not that this is an eddie kingston show but goddamn on the mic is he good i'm just throwing that i know this has nothing to do with, with it but when he takes the mic he, he is the most arrogant uh you know pompous prick and he is so good at it so good at it anyways continue soon as eddie kingston, i gotta say something <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then in Square Circle Wrestling, he was there for about five years. Uh, he wrestled the guys, uh, you know, against a guy named Kevin Steen, who's Kevin Owens now. What a bum! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <Bad> you know, <laughs> throughout his whole independent <laughs> career, he's wrestled with guys that we you know that are household names now. Um, he made his debut in Ring of Honor in 2008. Uh, like Mongo said, um, you know wrestling guys against Austin Aries, uh, Necro Butcher. Uh, let's see. I mean, Ring of Honor, too, he, he kind of had a little short run, but he did have some run-ins with CM, you know, CM Punk before CM Punk got into WB as well. So I think that's what, when they do go to NXT and do come up, I think that's what made their feuds great was, you know, CM Punk called himself the best in the world. Rolling, big CM Punk fan. I'm huge respect to him by the way i just want to shout out if you buy any cm punk merchandise right now he's donating all his proceeds to the huber family shows what a great guy is i'm not trying to steal your thunder roll and i know you mentioned that earlier on social media no and, and mick foley's doing the same thing um and we already know how great mick foley is but i know there's a lot of people that think that punk's a piece of crap for the way he treated the fans and and rightfully so the, the way he left and and kind of abandoned the fans i get there's some people that are and i know mongo's kind of in that majority of fans that you know felt that way and rightfully so but i i think it's the same thing with the chris benoit situation for me like i i separate the two like i get that once he left wwe he had to do what he had to do and he thought he's getting a raw deal there and he left and then, like i said the same thing i can separate benoit the wrestler versus benoit the murderer and some people can't and i just i get it i get it either way 
I, I think him coming out and saying what he said about Brody Lee because because of their time in Ring of Honor, not to totally totally squashed him Thunder too. Really opened my eyes that he did a lot more in the business I knew about because I'm I, I didn't really know much about CM Punk pre WWE and now that I know more and seeing and watching I watched a lot of highlights before this guy I wanted to see his independent career. Wow, uh, Brody Lee and him had had some good chemistry and I can see why it translated well and for him to step up and basically donate and he's a top merch seller. Um, he is a top merch selling pro Steve, so he's going to give a lot of money. And Brody Lee shirt, tribute shirt, broke the record. So it's really nice to see the wrestling community come together and just donate, you know, money that they need to live to give to another family. It shows what kind of impact he made all over the world. Yep. Absolutely. I just want to plug this too, and we're not getting paid to mention this or anything like that, but go to shopaew.com if you can. Buy the Brody Lee tribute shirt. All the proceeds are going to the Huber family. I know you guys both. Uh, bought the shirts i'm gonna buy one as well um we got we got five between mongo and i i think right (laughs) i bought one for my wife and myself and then you bought one for emily cam and you right so that's five there so and i do want to just make a quick side note we mentioned the mick foley uh just want to send our prayers to him you just uh diagnosed or just got diagnosed with covid um, so just want to, you know, best wishes to Mick or yep. McFlurry, as we call him here sometimes. Yes, yeah, McFlurry. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had Hunter come in and do his McFlurry spot. Damn, we missed an opportunity. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's get into his WWE career. He uh, signs a developmental contract with WWE in March of 2012. It's just hard to believe that's um, almost eight years ago now. And he made his debut uh, for FCW, Florida Championship Wrestling, uh, working under Luke Harper. Uh, so that's kind of the first time we see him, you know, as a Luke Harper character. Yeah, I think we already know that Vince wants to trademark. He wants that intellectual property. So, I mean, there's very few guys that get to keep their name or, keep, or use their real name. I mean, you have Cena and Orton who use their real names. And, you know, we have AJ who kept his name. But it's very few and far between. I mean... You know, you got guys like Cesaro that were out on the independent scene for so long. Uh, Finn Balor, same thing. He didn't get to keep his name. Um, so it, very rarely do you get to keep your name when you come to WWE. You know, Kevin Steen going to Kevin Owens. Yeah. Well, and he named his son Owen after Owen Hart. So, I mean, it made sense to, to go that way. But, yeah, no, it, it, it like you said, it, it, you can name a bunch of people very rarely. And it's surprising that, you know, AJ Styles got to keep his name. But, I mean, I don't know what you'd call him being that he had a 20-year career before he got there. Alan Jones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alan, Alan S. Jones. Yeah. S. Jones. Styles. Styles. S. Delivery Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Suplex Jones. Yeah. Um, so as we all know, uh, FCW was kind of rebranded to NXT in August of 2012, and uh, Harper made his TV debut in November – uh, NXT as a follower of Bray Wyatt um, and then this is kind of the beginning of the Wyatt family uh, Harper was the first son then Eric Rowan was the second son um, so this the Wyatt family here kind of the beginnings of it were you know in late 2012 it was really cool too I, I, it was like a swamp cult gimmick I remember Bray had like this ridiculous colorful shirt he used to come out with a straw hat mm. and I, I remember I remember the debut just he came out and the dirty, like, whatever you call it, wife beater, I guess that's not appropriate to say, but the, you know, tank top, the jeans, always had the bandanas, you know, so he still had some of his Brody Lee gimmick, but he made himself, like, dirty and grungy, I think, for the swamp. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Did you hear the Cesaro thing about how he always made sure his shirt smelled really good? Like, everybody, he, he made the comment about that, that <laughs> Brody, Brody took so much pride in making his shirts look dirty but still smell good that like if you ripped one he would be pissed because he spent <laughs> so much time getting it looking dirty but smelling clean that's um and that was one of the funny things that I, I remember hearing this past week about you know the stories about the guy and that just goes to prove to you i mean you you hear horror stories about people that wrestled with vader yeah and just guys that were just smelly nasty stinky and harper's like I'm, I'm just gonna look stinky i'm not actually gonna be stinky <laughs> so <laughs> For so I was gonna say for someone who kind of looked like they were grungy and dirty, like coming off the oil rig, you know, shout out to Big Rig. Um, yeah, yeah. He he just, I think that's cool. As I said, I didn't know that, but he looked like he would be gross, but he wasn't. And then just seeing how he cleaned up later on in his career, it's like wow, it's the same guy. 
And and speaking of that, how cool was it to see Lance Archer this past week uh, oh. dress up as as uh, Luke Harper? It, 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 dead ringer. It, it was a great great look on yeah. AEW. It was definitely awesome, you know. And I think it's because they had some time together in NXT uh, when mm-hmm. he was here, and it was just cool to see like it translate. And you could see seeing the Murder Hawk, who's supposed to be this big devastating beast, almost cry every time he took a bump. Oh. Yeah, well, Cole Cabana to start the show, dude. I'm telling you, yeah. he, he had red eyes the whole damn match. <laughs> so. I had red eyes the whole show, so I get it. <laughs> yeah, and shout out to AEW for you know they didn't directly acknowledge it, but you could tell that they were acknowledging his WWE career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they mentioned Luke Harper a couple times with you know with Chris Jericho. Uh, Chris Jericho in his tribute mentioned a time in Saudi Arabia, a story where like the arrow on the ceiling. And how Luke Harper knew, knew what that was. Um, so shout out to them the, for having knowledge. You see the picture that Jericho shared of them wearing the yeah 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 shirts because he was complaining about how he never had his own shirt. Yep. So yeah. I thought that was cool. I mean, it, it you know I shared that. I just thought it was cool that you know all these different people have had you know the impact he had on all these different people in different brands, different countries, and just whatever. I mean, it just shows you how cool and how respected and how loved Brody Lee was. John Huber, not whether it was Harper, you know, Brody Lee, whatever you want to call him, the man John Huber was well loved by it seems like everybody. And then nobody, not one person has been able to, not one wrestler over the years has been able to say everybody liked him. Like he, there's always someone like, you know, I mean, the Iron Sheik still hates Hulk Hogan. Right. I but I mean, say- it's just, he, there's always that one guy that has some problem with somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's funny too, his name, you know, his namesake, Brody, uh, who was murdered, you know, Bruiser Brody, excuse me, I can't say his name right, um, yeah. had the opposite. It seemed like nobody liked him. You know, it seemed like he was always right. in And it's kind of funny that he named himself and his child, you know, after Bruiser Brody, tried to want to keep that gimmick going, and then was the nicest dude. So it's just kind of funny how he named himself after the world's biggest dick. And he, yeah. He the world's nicest guy. And a family man. You know, that's that speaks to, you know, me. And I obviously, it speaks to Roland as well. Just the biggest thing was he would always run home just like Owen Hart, like, oh, show's over, got to go home to my kids. Like, right. I wish I could be half the dad he was, you know, he is. <laughs> yeah, no, he set the bar pretty friggin' high. There's no other way to, I mean, for someone that, you know, was on the road as much as he was, he had his priorities straight. He was on the road to provide for his family. When he was home, he was with his family. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so he makes his uh, main roster debut uh, for WWE in July um of uh 2012 oh, i'm sorry that would be 2013 um they started you know airing these vignettes of the debut of the wyatt family back in may um and then on july 8th they made their debut by assaulting kane and then uh july 26th smackdown uh he made his in-ring debut where he and rowan defeated tons of funk one of the greatest God. tag teams of all time. You know? Is that, is that Tensai and Brodus Clay? It is. Yes. <laughs> For the victory. For the victory. <laughs> Shout out to Roland's Wedding, who may or may not have had that song at one point. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> that was our entrance song. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I think that's the only thing I like about them was that you use their music because otherwise that well, team was we, we, we couldn't agree on a song. So like I literally was like, what's the most ridiculous song at the time I could think of? And I was like, this one. And she was like, all right, <laughs> we'll do that. And that's just where it went. <laughs> it was literally like we couldn't agree on any song for an entrance. And I was like, Well, if it's an entrance, it should be a wrestling song. And none, and none of us could come up with a good one. And then we went with the somebody called my mama. So <laughs> For good, bad, and different. Uh, no chance in hell it doesn't really work for a wedding. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could. Yeah. Uh, I, I could come out to the you know the, the Vince Strut, and I don't know what you know. Uh, yeah, there's there's like, there's so many entrances that you could use, but they're like one person one. So at least that one was a you know. And like yeah, I said, for better for worse, tell death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> and you really want to come out to DX, so <laughs> no. I tried. I tried. It did. Uh, I know we're a little bit off the rails here. I tried. But, uh, you know, she wasn't having it. She wasn't crotch chopping in a wedding dress. So <laughs> I'll crotch chop in a, in a tux all day long. I don't give a crap. <laughs> so um, Harper and Rowan would go on uh, to defeat some teams 
And then uh, they suffered the first loss against Cody Rhodes and Goldust in October. Who just oh, got- Cody Rhodes has been crushing him for years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why Cody got to let him uh, dismantle him so hard to take the, the TNT championship from him. He owed him a couple years. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> he always gave Cody the rub, so, so it was about time that right, Cody yeah. brought him over. Yeah, I guess so. Good Lord. That, that's that's a, quite a coincidence, really, you think about it. I know it's really eerie, too, because, you know, as Tim was saying, he made his debut in NXT, I mean, FCW, March 12th, 2012. It was right around the same time that he made his debut in AEW of 2020. So it's kind of eerie that both his debuts – or, yeah, uh, I mean, it was to, to the day. supposed to be in Rochester too, unfortunately, because of COVID, it screwed everything up. You imagine the pop you would have gotten in Rochester. Oh my god, it would have been unreal because yeah. that crowd was already white hot. I remember the week before because it was supposed to be blood and guts, supposed to be their version of war games. So that crowd was already hot because you essentially had the elite go against the inner circle, and then he was going to debut. It would have just been a white hot crowd, his hometown. I, it's the one thing I think. He didn't get to do to get that pop. I think that sucks the most for him. He didn't get that pop. Him and Matt Hardy, they both debuted. It was supposed to be this big thing. And I mean, it was still big, but it's just too bad that COVID kind of took that from him. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The Wyatt family would start a rivalry with CM Punk and Daniel Bryan. Um, Again, we covered the history on the independent scene. So it's kind of come full circle now in WWE. Um, they would lose a match at Survivor Series uh, to Punk and Brian, and then the following month at the TLC pay per view, uh, the Wyatt family would defeat Brian in a three on one handicap match. So that kind of rounds out uh, his 2013 year. And then uh, he competes at the Royal Rumble in January of 2014, uh, and then they begin a, f- a feud with the Shield. Uh, we all know who the Shield are. Um, and then they, they actually ended up beating the Shield at Elimination Chamber that year. Which I, I wrote down a list of like my top five matches. I was trying to think of one. And that was probably my number one match. That match at Elimination Chamber, holy crap, did he, he, he show up. I remember Seth Rollins trying to get the crowd going. And he, I think, was messing with Seth Rollins because he got the crowd, even though they were essentially the heel faction, he got the crowd hotter than Seth Rollins did. And Seth Rollins was doing those crazy dives like he does and – he was just going in there, just destroying everybody. I rewatched that match, and I definitely recommend it. Elimination Chamber 2014. If you hadn't haven't seen it, it's probably one of his best matches in WWE. Well, and that feud, the, the the Wyatts and the Shield were kind of designed to feud each other eventually. Anyways, they were both groups three. They were both you know doing their own things, different you know the way they wanted to, and eventually they had to come to a head. And uh, you know this is back before Vince went senile, so he at least you know understood what was supposed to happen in wrestling. So <laughs> he built it up the way they should have. And, you know, he wasn't making changes every week and, and let it go. The best part was they kept him apart long enough for them to build each other up and then come at each other. And it, it made for great TV. It made for great pay-per-view and uh, all six guys could go. Absolutely. Uh, then they would, um, you know, challenge for the uh, WWE tag team championships uh, held by the Usos at the time. Um, they did not, they unsuccessfully challenged them at a couple pay per views, uh, Battleground and Money in the Bank. And then, uh, eventually, uh, that leads us to the Wyatt family splitting up and they going, each of them going into singles competition, which was failed from the get go. Yeah. Yeah. That's when, that's the moment when Vince went senile right there. I agree. I, I, I understand giving everyone a singles run, but, you can still do a singles run without destroying teams. I don't think Vince gets that. You don't have to break. Oh, oh, this team's got to disband, so I can throw together these other throw together tag teams. You know, and right? Like, no, they can still team up when they need to. You can incorporate part of the storyline. I mean, I'm I'm glad he got the IC push that he did, but why well, ruin something that you know people love? I mean, we got two years of the Wyatt family, which really wasn't long enough. No, I mean, look at the New Day. I mean, they're split up right now, technically, but Big E still acknowledges the New Day, and the New Day still acknowledges Big E. How hard is that to have yeah. people be together but not always be together? Right, and then worst case scenario, you throw them together at a pay-per-view for a special appearance because yeah, that, that exactly. they get buy rates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you have, you know, say say that you have an issue with one, one tag team from one show, and you have, you know, you, it's easy to do. But, yeah, like you said, you don't need to split them up. I mean, yeah, you can split them up on paper, but you don't need to split the group up. Yeah, it's it's like his favorite trope, and it bothers me the most. Like, 
oh, let's split, you know, let's split up this tag team and then have them hate each other so we can have a reunion in three years. Or you could just let them do their own thing and come together once in a while like DX did for years. Yeah, well, and then <laughs> you have like the most prime example of that horse shit is uh, Otis and Tucker. Yep. Mm-hmm. You split Otis and Tucker up. Tucker had one match after that. We haven't seen him since. He's gone. He, he, probably, he'll probably be released next. Whoever, yeah, I mean, he for whatever reason they're going with Otis and, and poor Tucker, who has talent because if he didn't, he wouldn't be there. Is no, just you know he he looks like a freaking jobber now. He's wearing long tights. He looks like the typical jobber from the from the early nineties. Shorty G. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Alpha, even, yeah. even he has a decent gimmick now, and he's with Otis. I mean, the gimmick's at least decent. But I mean, it you know, it's a prime example of them thinking they have more than they actually do, and, and it, it ruins careers of some of the guys. I mean, and it, yeah, and I think this kind of led to his unhappiness because this was him just being thrown in the machine for years and years. Just it, it thinks it's like, yeah, it's, I'm glad he got to stay with Rowan and everything, but it's like the Wyatt family was white hot. Like I still remember the Wyatt. I mean. You couldn't go to an arena without seeing the little fireflies everywhere mm-hmm. with the cell phones. Yeah. You couldn't go to an arena without seeing the sheet mask everywhere in the crowd. Mm-hmm. And then to split them up, just it made no sense creatively. No, and then, like I said, if you wanted to put you know Bray on one show and then Rowan and Harper on the other, you could have done that. There's easy ways to, you know. And then when he needs his his you know family there, they're there, whether they're supposed to be or not. That's that's the point of Bray Wyatt's character. Well, you know, I mean, you could very easily, you know, if you had a if you had a brand split, and I'm not saying they had one then, but you know, if you had one now, like you do, and you have the New Day, and say that Big E was Bray Wyatt, and the New Day were Harper and Rowan, how hard would it be for the lights to go out and those two big bastards to show up? It wouldn't be that hard. They're not supposed to be there, but that's the point. Exactly, craziness. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. Um, so. He would join uh, Team Authority for Survivor Series of 2014, and he was awarded a uh, <laughs> that was a whole authority storyline. Um, Triple H and Shane Mc- or Stephanie, and that's when Rowan joined the other team, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, what a bunch of hot garbage that was. Yeah. Uh, he was awarded though a match against uh, the Intercontinental Champion Dolph Ziggler, uh, which Harper won after an interference with Seth Rollins. Um, so that was his first main title that he won, was the IC title in 2014. What he hold it for like three days? I mean, he didn't hold it for very long. It's on like 27, uh, yeah. 28 days. Yeah, it was barely yeah. a month. Yeah, he lost it, was, it back at TLC, so probably about a month. He held yeah, it. he wasn't, you know, and that's that's literally putting a title on somebody to pacify somebody. Is all that is. Yeah, it, he he didn't get a good run with it. It's not fair and. Him and Dolph had good chemistry together. I mean, that TLC match that they had, even though it was the table ladder and stairs, I think they ended up calling it. Some of the bumps each other they took. I mean, and that's the big thing. Brody Lee was a bumper. Like, he was a big dude, but he took some gnarly bumps. Well, and he could do things nobody else could do at, at that size. I mean, he obviously, he's not doing shooting star presses and whatnot, but for a guy yeah. that's <laughs> that big to be able to, you know, go over the top rope. I mean, look at, look at the undertaker. I mean, as he got older, he almost died like what, 20 times. I mean, every time, every time he went over the top rope or, or jumped, you know, through, through a table or whatever. You know, Goldberg. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, yeah, that's a death sentence anyways, but he yeah, asked Bret Hart, uh, Bret Hart from what 90, was it 99? 99, that, yeah. We covered that show a couple of years ago. Yeah. You know, it, it just, I mean, but like, it just shows you the type of, the fact that he could go gave him an appeal and then Vince just never stuck with it. And I don't know why, I don't know if it was, he didn't like the character of him looking like a, a hobo or, uh, you know, grungy. Yeah. I, I don't know. But, you know, like I said, Vince is so weird when it comes to people. How do you not build this guy up as a big bruiser Brody monster? I mean, how, how do you, how do you miss that? I don't, I don't get it. It's because he didn't understand him. I mean, there's a good podcast out there where, he, on, where he's with Talk is Jericho, and he talks about how Vince wanted him to have a southern accent, and yep. he tried to do a southern I'm accent. From Rochester, New York, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I remember that. Yeah, and I think that's what it was. It just yeah, it just yeah. goes show he didn't understand what he had because so because they wouldn't give him the, you know they didn't give him the stick to talk on you know so he couldn't really get across what his character was. So unfortunately people just saw him as the Wyatt family member because Vince didn't give him the push he deserved. Right. 
Uh, so now we're entering uh, 2015 here. Uh, he is entered into the Royal Rumble match, and interestingly enough, he was eliminated by Bray Wyatt. <laughs> and then um, he was in March. He began a storyline with Bad News Barrett, where they were there was other wrestlers trying to steal his Intercontinental title. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. <laughs> I guess this is where Brody started stealing titles, huh? Because I became... <laughs> yeah, he carried that over, didn't he? Pretty much. Uh, he would wrestle uh, in a seven-man ladder match at WrestleMania 31, uh, which Daniel Bryan won. And after that, he started a feud with Dean Ambrose, um, which he would lose a match against Dean at Extreme Rules. And then uh, he took part in the King of the Ring tournament that year, uh, but was eliminated by Neville or Pac now uh, in the first round. Yeah, so fun story. Pac, Neville, whatever you want to call him, is the biggest tool I've ever met. I've met a lot of wrestlers. <laughs> Probably the biggest douchebag I've ever met. And it was not in gimmick. I know I, I people say, oh, you probably worked. No, he was on the cruise ship with us. He was at the meet and greet. So he figured, okay, he's at the meet and greet. He wants to interact with people. We went up to him. I asked, hey, how's it going? He's like, shitty. I'm like, oh, you're not having a good time? No. I was like, oh, do you mind if we get a picture? I don't take pictures. Oh, okay. Why are you here? <laughs> and <laughs> I just, yeah, and I just, pretty much that's what it was. He's like, they made me yeah. come. And I was like, oh, do you mind signing? Do you mind signing? He's like, I have to, don't I? And I was like, oh, okay. And he, you can tell he wasn't a gimmick because he was literally talking to QT Marshall's wife, who was like his handler. He's like, is this fucking over you? I'm sick of these marks. So you could tell he wasn't even in gimmick. And it's like, so yeah, so big fuck you to Pac, I guess. Uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you failed as Neville for a reason, douchebag. Yep. Anyway, but yeah, no, I didn't uh, I didn't know that. That's uh that's too bad. I liked Pac. I, I don't yeah. like him anymore. But again, also shows, you know, Brody's character. He was willing to put over you know, the little, the, the little dude there, you know, get him in the King of the Ring tournament. Yeah, which... The Mighty Mouse character. There we go. Like... I'm like, I couldn't remember what it was. It was stupid superhero. <laughs> yeah, character. a little, little Mighty Mouse. <laughs> so, um, eventually the Wyatt family kind of returns. Uh, in May, he kind of renews his alliance with Rowan, but Rowan suffers an injury, kind of killing that momentum. It always kind of seems to happen when they kind of reunite teams. It always seems like there's some sort of injury or just. Oh, and then and then Harper got hurt too shortly thereafter when, when they almost uh, and that's when they had to reintroduce Strowman to the yeah. to the. So um, Harper, yeah, Harper reunited with Bray Wyatt at Battleground, helping him defeat Roman Reigns. Uh, then Harper and Wyatt went against Reigns and Dean Ambrose at SummerSlam, uh, which they lost. And then the following night after SummerSlam is when Braun Strowman uh, joined Harper and Wyatt as a new member of the Wyatt family. Was that when he had like that weird black sheet mask? Yes. That when, okay. I was going to say, we had that awful, you're going bald, but I'm going to have this weird haircut anyway. Get... <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, like Roman was saying, that injury always seemed to derail them. You know, if the Bludgeon Brothers, I'm sure, as we'll get into later, and every time it's like Rowan and him, they were such a good tag team, but one of them was getting hurt. They got hurt at the same time, and it just it killed their momentum, and it sucks because they were both such good workers. Yeah, it's it's too bad that you know it, it literally seems to be the way for everybody. Like it seems like every team that that comes back together or has any any you know any steam going there always seems to be this massive injury that, that sets everything back. I mean, something as simple as the, as the root, uh, the riot squad with Ruby riot. I mean, they had a little bit of, you know, momentum going, then she blows out both her shoulders. And again, not, not that she, you know, they could have been champions by now, but you know, it's not, again, not a big name, but it's just, it, you look at it through the history. There's always seems to be the, the injury bug that bites one of the two people or one of the, you know, two or three, depending on how many is in the group that screws everything up. No, I know, and I feel bad too because when Eric Rowan and Harper were together, when you know they kind of were split, they weren't really back together. I liked them together because they were two monsters, and mm. you know they were just they could work. And I was genuinely like, "Damn, they're gonna hurt people." I know they weren't, but like you had that feeling, like you know, this guy's about to die. 
Well, and I mean, we're going to get into it shortly here. I would imagine it's coming up soon with the the, the uh, Bludgeon Brothers thing. In, in Mongo, you saw them live at one of the pay-per-views you went to, right? Yep. I got to, I don't know if you want to get into WrestleMania, but I would, now I get to where, WrestleMania. Where are we on the timeline there, Tim? How close are we to, what WrestleMania was that, Mongo? That was uh, WrestleMania 34 in New Orleans. Okay. Yeah, we got a little bit to cover okay. before we get to the. I don't, I don't want to step on Tim's toes. He's our <laughs> timeline leader here. So right. <laughs> but I'm just saying. I mean, it, it's glad. I'm glad that they got that it, to, to to put into perspective what I was getting at. I'm glad that they did get that push finally as a team, and, and as the Bludgeon Brothers, and be able to win the titles. And again, I'm jumping ahead, but it just proves that there's people that are better together than apart, and then they were, especially in the WWE. Hey, great. Yeah, so, and then they, um, you know, they had some feuds against the Brothers of Destruction, uh, which led to a match between the two of them at Survivor Series. Uh, then they go on to have a feud with the Dudley Boys and Tommy Dreamer and Rhino. Uh, that was when that, ECW, like, attacked them, right? That was, like, yeah. okay. <laughs> ECW, uh, ECW. And then, like Roland said, then he suffered an injury in March, um, he had a dislocated patella and, uh, you know, because of that, he wasn't able to be drafted, uh, in the 2016 draft. And then we get to the whole, uh, Randy Orton storyline where Randy Orton, uh, joins the Wyatt family. This was some good shit. I don't care what anybody says. This was yeah. good. Stuff. I'm glad they've kind of reconnected. still is to this day. Yeah. The stuff they're doing with Orton and Wyatt now is some good stuff too. I, I, you know, Orton. Probably one of the best feuds going. Well, and for everybody that, that craps on Orton, um, it just goes to show you in the right program, he's money. I mean, money as can be. It's because they don't understand him. <laughs> Again, Vince being senile and has no idea what to do. With him. <laughs> but, We're going to make Orton a face, damn it. It's like, no, that's a bad <laughs> idea. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> so Wyatt and Orton capture the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championships at, uh, at TLC. And... Uh, then they announced that Harper had been sanctioned as a champion as well. So under the Freebird rule, we're in uh, and the uh, tag team titles. Can I just say I hate the Freebird rule with a passion. I absolutely hate it. It has no place in wrestling nowadays. It just it just confuses the hell out of the storytelling of the matches. Like, oh, you, there's three people in this group. Okay, well you're all champions. Like, no, no. And you get a title. And you <laughs> get a title. Thanks, Oprah. <laughs> It, Vince, just pull the trigger on you know three man tag titles like every other promotion is doing. Like AEW is going to be having theirs come out soon. Just pull the title if you really want groups to have titles. Then do the six man tag belts. Don't. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't like that. I've always hated the freebird rule. I just had to get off my chest. It bothers no, me. It, it, it there the only team that's really pulled it off halfway decently is the New Day. In all honesty, and that was just because of their gimmick. It, it made it made it you know another wrinkle in their gimmick but uh, like you were saying with with harper being one of the champions harper never trusted orton from the get-go in this storyline so this is what made that storyline so interesting that from the get-go harper didn't trust randy orton at all yeah we kind of we get to some uh tension between harper and orton um after orton and bray wyatt they lose to american alpha uh for the tag team titles uh so they get harper and orton get into it um, and they have a match on SmackDown, which Orton won. And then after that, Wyatt attacked Harper with Sister Abigail, and that kind of in turn kind of separated Wyatt uh, or separated Harper from the group. He's been exiled to the yeah. island of misfit toys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we get into another Royal Rumble. He enters it. Uh, he attacks Wyatt and Orton, gets eliminated by Goldberg. Oh wow. man, Goldberg! Yeah, wow. <laughs> makes Goldberg. sense. Wow. We've come full circle. We just mentioned him about ten minutes ago. Boom! There he is. There he is. Bad rash. Him and Brock Lesnar just like to ruin any good storyline and momentum going. Vince is yeah. like, how can I script this great year I've had? <laughs> uh, it was around this time that Harper uh, turned face for the first time in his career. He helped John Cena uh, with his feud with Orton and Wyatt. And he defeated Randy Orton at Elimination Chamber. Um, and then he challenged for the number one contendership for the WWE title against AJ Styles, but he, he lost. Pardon me as I flip my notes around. I was going to say, yeah, then it kind of goes into 
uh, Mania 33, which was when I was at that one. He was at he was in that Andre the Memorial Battle Royal, the one that Gronk interfered in. Yep. Um, one thing that kind of bugged me about that was no one gets an entrance to the Battle Royal, so they just come out. So you don't even know who's in the match when you're in the crowd. You just see like this line of people just start walking out, for, and then and you, and you have like, to sit there and try to like look at who's who. Like you're like, oh, that's uh, you know, yeah, that's so, I, so thankfully he's such a big guy that I could tell, but. He, you couldn't tell what was going on. And that it was those matches are such a cluster, and I kind of feel bad. I mean, they go from being so white hot. They he goes from having these great matches to he's now on a battle royal that puts Mojo friggin' Raleigh over. <laughs> Where are they now? <laughs> Not hype. <laughs> so he got eliminated by Titus O'Neil in that battle royal. Um, he then entered a feud with Eric Rowan, which led to a match between the two at Backlash, which you won. Uh, then he entered into a match to determine the number one contendership for the U.S. title, uh, which he, uh, which was won by AJ Styles. Uh, and then after that, he kind of disappeared um, from WWE for a little bit. Creative has nothing for you, pal. <laughs> We're going to pay you, but you're going to go home. Yeah, you know, as you it's say, probably, it's probably broke his heart because, I mean, he hated being home so much. So. Right, I was going to say, oh, <laughs> darn. <laughs> Vince, stupid. But I mean, that's that was definitely even more of the beginning of the end because it's like you you just took him from these great matches to the WrestleMania pre-show where he doesn't even get a spot to go home. Like, yeah. And then what? Then Vince wonders why he's disgruntled and starts asking for his release. Well, gee, I don't know. You went from using me, giving me a paycheck every week to oh. <laughs> right, and, and his thing was, I want to wrestle and provide for my family. I don't want to stay at home. I mean, I don't mind being home, but like, I this is how I provide for my family. Why? Why are? Why, why am I not allowed to do that? Right, and then because they're independent contractors, even though they're not, he saw like he could go work other places while at home to try to bring more income in. He just had to rely on his contract, which a lot of them have like downside guarantees and you know merch. He didn't have merch, and you don't really get a downside guarantee if you don't wrestle. So he's getting his base salary, and he can't work anywhere else. So, right, yeah, super super fair, Ben. Super fair. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we fast forward a little bit to October tenth uh, uh, episode of SmackDown. Uh, Harper returns as a heel uh, in a vignette. Uh, he's a, once again aligned himself with Rowan. And this is uh, the debut of the Bludgeon Brothers. Probably the the best thing they did the whole time he was in, besides the Wyatt family, obviously. But the best thing they did that wasn't related to the Wyatt family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I remember too. They both like shortened their name too. It was like just Rowan and just Harper at that yeah. point. I yeah. think. Vince well, yeah, they, like were, they, were, names. <laughs> they were going for the axe and smash thing for uh, the demolition. demolition. Yeah. yeah, Harper and Rowan. That's it. Pretty sick gear too. Right? The, the, like the. It was nice to kind of see them doing the gear, but it, they had some really cool gear, like with their like masks that had like the tubing in it and stuff like that that Savini made. Yeah, no, they they had some cool in those big ass friggin' mallets. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they had some some neat. Like I said, it was easily the best thing they did besides the Wyatt family stuff when when Wyatt family was red hot or white yeah. hot or whatever hot you want to call it. But and it you know, goes to show how good of a worker is he. He changed his character again. You know, Ben said, "Here, do this gimmick." He's like, "Okay." And, he did it well. Yeah. At least he didn't try to make him be a hick. <laughs> no. He gave, like, he gave up on that. He's like, all right, this Southern accent thing is not going to work from a guy from Rochester, New York. <laughs> so the Blood and Brothers would, you know, they would wrestle the Hype Bros, Zack Ryder, Mojo Rawley, uh, Rizongo. Um, then they, they eventually begin to target. Hot garbage. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. They got, they got fence hot garbage there. Yikes. Yeah. Anyway. It gets a little bit better. Then they start to go after the Usos and the New Day. There we go. That's more like it. Yeah. Uh, the the three teams had a match at WrestleMania 34. Ah, Mongo, you're up. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, that WrestleMania, I so I was lucky enough. I've been to you know a few WrestleManias. I got to go to WrestleMania 24. I went to 33, and then I wasn't supposed to go to 34, but my buddy Mark had gotten an extra ticket. Um, and so I'm backed out. He texts me like two days before. He's like, Hey, do you want to come down to mania? And I was like, uh, yep. <laughs> so <laughs> I bought the ticket off him and flew down. We were in the process of moving to, to where we are now. So that was super fun to try to figure out logistically. But so I got to go down there. And if you've never been to WrestleMania, it's, it's 
a week long event. You see everyone walk around, and it was cool to be there because this is actually one of the matches I remember the most. I rewatched it to make sure I wasn't crazy, but that tag team match because of the card was kind of so so was probably one of the best matches. You know, all these three teams fighting. You had the Usos, you had the Bludgeon Brothers, you had the New Day. I'm not really the biggest New Day fan, but I think they're funny. Um, and then being a huge Green Ranger fan, to hear him play the freaking Dragon Zord to summon out the Pancake People was one of the best moments of my WrestleMania experience. <laughs> and then I got to see the Bludgeon Brothers win the tag titles, which who I was rooting for, because I was like, well, the Usos have already had it for a while. It's time to give it to someone else. Don't really want the New Day to have it, so I was rooting for the Bludgeon Brothers. And they just dominated the whole match. And just, I remember and, it was and me and my friend Mark just going, yeah. And they were just destroying it. And it was great because that crowd was so hot for them. Like it was, I, they weren't supposed to be cheering them, but they were. And, you know, Jimmy Uso took took a huge shot to the stomach, and you know the crowd was just cheering. And you could see the commentators looking at the crowd like, "What the hell?" <laughs> the fans get it. Yep. Uh, so then they would go on, the Bludgeon Brothers, to face the likes of um, Gallows and Anderson, Team Hell No. Uh, they would eventually lose uh, their titles to the New Day in a no DQ match uh, in on SmackDown. Uh, Rowan actually suffered an injury during that match. Uh, so there, here's it on hiatus. there it is again. Anytime they start getting a push, one of those two big bastards got hurt, unfortunately. Because, I mean, they, they could still be there right now. If they had done that gimmick right, I mean, I'm glad they're not because, uh, you know, the AEW stuff's fantastic. But, I mean, think about it. If he didn't get hurt and they kept going, that gimmick could still be going now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he then made – uh, this is kind of an interesting note. He made a surprise appearance at an NXT house show uh, where he got defeated by Ricochet for the NXT North American Championship. Richard O'Shea. Yes. <laughs> our truth, our truth thinks he's Richard O'Shea. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. uh, then after that, he took some time off. He had a uh, to heal a wrist injury. Uh, he made his return in March of 2019, uh, defeating Mo Dorali at a house show in his hometown of Rochester. Um, let's see. He then at WrestleMania 35, he was part of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. He was eliminated by Braun Strowman, oddly enough. Yeah, and that there's a reason that's on Botchamania. If you guys watch Botchamania, he's literally holding Ollie up in a suplex, yelling, Braun, Braun, because he's like waiting to suplex Ollie out of the ring. And Braun Strowman doesn't know what the hell he's doing. So he's just around the ring. And you can literally hear him say, Get over here at one point. And then Ali took a nasty bump into the announce table and he put out and now he's the leader of retribution. Unfortunately. <laughs> Well, no, I'm just saying that's probably where it started. Right. But it's I, I thought it was nice, though, that Ali put out that he basically saved him because as they were going down, he realized he had too much momentum because Braun took so long. And he had to, like, cradle his neck because he went. He knew he was going to his announce table. Ali's like, yeah, that dude saved me from breaking my neck that day. And he wrote some nice words on Twitter about him. And I thought, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that. So I went back and watched. I'm like, oh, my God. He held him for a good, like, 20 seconds just waiting for Braun. It's well, super he's yelling at Braun Strowman to wake the hell up to get over there. <laughs> Pretty yeah. much. But the strength there, holy crap, just to sit there and hold that, hold Ali, who's still, you know, you're talking 200-pound dude. Yeah, I mean, he's not a, a small, small guy, but he's also not huge. But still, like you said, it, it does stand, hold somebody there 20, 30 seconds waiting for that big, dumb oaf to come over and do what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're shouting at him. So I found this pretty interesting in my notes here. Um, he, there was a time where Harper wrestled EC3 in a dark match before SmackDown, and apparently Vince uh, hated the match, so he canceled uh, plans for a feud with Sami Zayn, and that's kind of where Harper requested his release. Um, if he hasn't been, hadn't been appearing on you know weekly television at that time, that yeah. killed EC3's career too. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. And this is when uh, he started randomly tweeting out, it's Monday, you know what that means. Just, his Twitter was, if you go back through his timeline, right around this time, is all his tweets were, it's Monday, you know what that means. It's Tuesday, you know what that means. And people were like, no, what does it mean? And it was great because he went on with a good year and a half of this tweet with no context, which is why, you, you know. It means that won't be on back. fucking TV this week again. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what it turns out to, yeah, what it turns out to mean. 
Uh, yeah, and this, you know, that's kind of the, you know, winding down his WWE career. Uh, he does go back to the Luke Harper name at Clash of Champions in September uh, by attacking Roman Reigns um, in Roman's match against Eric Rowan. Uh, then he returns to SmackDown Live where he, uh, you know, attacks Dan O'Brien. And then he does have a match at Hell in the Cell with Rowan. Uh, they're defeated by Reigns and Bryan in a tag team match. Uh, he was then drafted to Raw. And then his last match, televised match in the WWE, was a Battle Royal at the Crown Duel event in oh. October. <laughs> Which is that story you were talking about earlier that Jericho mentioned on the uh, on Dynamite, Dynamite show. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about how he knew what the arrow was to Mecca. Yeah. And then he was officially released on December 8th uh, that year, uh, 2019, from his WWE contract. So that kind of, you know, doesn't, didn't really have a satisfying end to his WWE career. Nope. No. And I'm glad that he went to AEW and did what he did there. Because you imagine if, you know, he had passed away, you know, that year. Mm-hmm. Holy crap. Like, that nobody would even, I mean, people would have cared. But, like, if he didn't have this run with AEW... I don't think people like like you had said Mongo earlier that he just just started to establish himself as a main event type of guy, the the person that Vince wouldn't let him be. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. You know, some people only know what Vince shows them because he has too much power and he doesn't understand the gimmicks. And there's many quotes, many wrestlers saying, "If Vince didn't create the gimmick, or if Vince doesn't understand the gimmick, you're done." Yep. Uh, so, yeah, he makes his AEW debut March 18th of this year. Um, he's the Exalted One, the leader of the Dark Order. Uh, they attacked SCU. SCU. <laughs> Sorry. Sad dude. Uh, he, was, he started his career undefeated for a few weeks. Uh, he then challenged John Moxley for the AEW World Championship at Double or Nothing, uh, which he lost. In, in that point, that's where he stole the belt again. So he, he's now stolen his second belt that we know of. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, he was a belt klepto, the collector. <laughs> <laughs> then in August, uh, he dominated Cody to win the TNT Championship. Yeah, he's he literally like Rome was saying earlier. I think that was Cody finally giving him the rub. He he squashed him. <laughs> well, and they built it up well too because Cody had been in matches every single week and been really close to losing every single week. So the story was really good. It was set up beautifully for somebody to just come in and beat the ever-loving crap out of him and have him lose the title. And it just, it, you know, luckily it was Brody. And uh, it, I think that that the way he won it solidified how much of a, of a force Brody Lee was. And to interject some of his humor, one of my favorite little lines he had, I think it was on BTE, laughed. He goes, well, what, what lasted longer, Cody's pyro or the match? <laughs> <laughs> Um, then at all out in September, and this, this this is really hard to talk about because this is just a few months ago now. Yeah, they're, they're getting to, uh, you know, Brody Lee uh, teamed with uh, Colt Cabana, Evil Uno, and Stu Grayson. They lost to Matt Cardona, who's Zack Ryder, uh, Scorpio Sky, Dustin Rhodes, and QT Marshall. Uh, he would defend the TNT Championship successfully against Dustin Rhodes and Orange Cassidy. Um, then on September 23rd, uh, Cody returned and Lee challenged Cody to a dog carlin match, uh, for the championship. Um, and then on October 7th, he lost his final match, which ended his reign, um, as TNT champion. It's fitting for him to have named himself after Bruiser Brody to then have a dog collar match his last match yeah right it's it's messed up to think about it that way but the more you think about it the more you're like well i guess if he had to go at least he went off on like i mean the dog club but besides the match that cody had with dustin the dog collar match is probably the second best match they've had that cody's had since he's been in aew and that's yeah. saying cody's had a ton of matches no i would agree and i think seeing greg valentine there obviously was special I mean, uh, someone had to wake him up to let him know it was his time to look at the camera. <laughs> Showing him, and he's like, <laughs> well, he's old. You gotta give him a little credit there. But <laughs> Not as bad as Titan board a few months earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, it was cool to see, but still, I they probably should have let him know he's gonna be on camera at some point. Right. 
No, like you were saying, what a fitting way to like have a final match if you had it. At least his final match wasn't like, oh, you lost to Mojo Rowling in a dark, dark match. Like, at least it was. <laughs> right? yeah. you we know, had you go with EC3. We hated it. You're done. Right. You know? I think, you know, from what you read on the dirt sheets, again, you don't know what's true or not, but it sounds like he had some sort of, you know, rehabbing injuries anyway. So he, they were planning to take time off. That's why he put Cody over in the dog collar match. And then that's when, right. you know, unfortunately his other issue was discovered that, you know, took his life, but that match, it was brutal. And I rewatched that match again too. And that's probably one of my favorite AEW matches besides, like you said, the double or nothing that Cody did. Cause it's just so brutal. And, you know, that chain was ridiculously long. There's some points where he, they're wrapping each other up and they're just like beating the living shit out of each other. Yeah, no, it, it was a, a definitely a great match for that, you know, for, for what it was. They, did, they, didn't treat, they didn't treat it like a steel cage match like WWE does and somehow no one gets busted open, but they get thrown in the cage 53 times. <laughs> so they, they made it as real as they could and made it look like it should. You know, and you're not going to go into a dog collar match with, with a steel chain and somebody isn't going to get busted open. Right. It, it, it just shows you how fake it is. You, that's, you don't want to do that. It, it's so unbelievable. And um, think about that. Like Tim said, what was that? That was October, right? The dog collar match? Yeah, that was October 7th. October yeah. 7th. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, think about that. Uh, two and a half months later, he's gone. It's crazy. It's crazy. I think crazy. Really, and I was just talking to – you know, Emily, a few, like a few weeks ago, I was like, where's Brody been? Cause you, you know, you'd see the dark order pop up right on the dynamite. And like, oh, maybe he's rehabbing an injury or something. Cause they didn't really yeah. explain what happened. And then, and I think like you said, at the top of the show, that's why it just came as a shock. You're like, wait, what? Like he yeah. was just in that match. That was two months ago. What the, and this, it's like the longest, worst year ever for 2020. So you're like, wasn't that like last week? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 like you said, every week when the Dark Order was on TV, you figured eventually he was going to show back up. You you would figure that they would have had it set up so that way after like a loss, he would come out and just berate the ever loving crap out of somebody in, in in the Dark Order and you know regain his leadership. And while we're on that, how cool would it be if AEW could get Rowan to lead the Dark Order? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I've been yeah. thinking about. It. I mean, he's not signed or anything, but I, I mean, for Rowan to step in and be the the, the leader of the Dark Order. That would be such a cool storyline. I don't think they will do that, but I think it would be so cool if they could. And, and then you have to get Jericho to learn that it's Redbeard, not Rowan, so he doesn't get <laughs> sued. Because <laughs> Eric Rowan about four times, and he, every time he said it, Excalibur is like, it's Eric Redbeard! Every <laughs> single time. And he's yeah. like, like you know, Jericho, it's Eric Rowan! No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're probably a Tony Khan in the headset, like, shut up, shut up, yeah. it's another fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just comical that, like, after every time he said Rowan, Excalibur's like, is there a red beard? <laughs> 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 Trying to, like, you know, it's like, oh. But, yeah, I, I just think that would be such a cool storyline. And they're not going to probably do it, but it would uh, it would be pretty cool if, you know, to keep the Dark Order. I mean, obviously, I don't see the Dark Order going anywhere anytime soon. They, they have enough following where they're not going to. But um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the Dark Order now that the Exalted One is gone. Yeah, no, I agree. Because I mean, they finally, the Dark Order has finally started being, you start taking them seriously. Because, you know, when they first debuted with Evil Uno and Stu Grayson, it was like this weird, like, slave gimmick where he, like, yeah. sat on people. And I was like, eh, I'm not into it. Like, I'm good. Like, this is weird. Well, and, and Evil Uno, like, there's a third of him missing now. Like, where he, he's lost a ton of weight. He's not anywhere near as big as he was when he de- debuted either. Like, so he's getting the best shape of his life to, to go in this dark order thing. And then Brody ends up passing away. It's like, man, they had so much stuff going. Think of the, 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 the Alex silver and or the, the John silver and Alex, uh, what the hell is his name? Reynolds. Reynolds. Thank you. I could, I've totally lost my mind. Think of like the stuff they've done, like re- the recruiting specialists, like the stuff with him and, him and page, like the stuff with hangman page has been friggin' amazing. Um, you know, you think of, like you said, the, the BTE stuff, some of the stuff they've done. You know, I mean, the the outfit that Brody bought for John Silver, Johnny Hungy, um, it's cool because he literally looked like a mini Brody Lee. I mean, that you know, that was the point. But, um, yeah, it's um, to, to think of how that went from October 7th to December 26th, it's crazy. No, it's it definitely is and it's i think what's crazy is just to see the real emotions on everyone like yeah that's and no one showed any emotions these past two months and i'm not saying that they weren't weren't emotional but they held it together so well to not lead on that something was wrong 
Yeah. You know, I think it was you who sent the in the group text about they did a segment with Kenny Omega dropping the title to his son mm-hmm. during yep. a taping. It's like so they 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 knew that something was wrong realistically bad since mid December and they still kept it together for mm-hmm. you know the tapings and never let on. And I was like well, and that, that's the best thing that AEW could have done for his family and his kids too, not to cut you off, but for them to treat them, the, the family for AEW, I don't have pronouns, pal, for AEW to treat uh, the Uber family the way that they did, even before all of this, just tells you the type of people that Tony Khan, Cody, the Bucks, everybody that's involved there. Um, they're not, you know, and, and for what Vince is too, from what I've heard, for the most part, Vince is one of the more caring guys too. Some of the stuff he's done, he's also done some shady shit, but it just proves to you that if you care, care about what you're doing, you can treat people the right way and, and do the right thing, even for the family before all this happens. Because like you said, the Kenny Omega thing, obviously that was fairly recent because Kenny didn't win the title up until a month ago. Mm-hmm. So you had to know that Brody at this point, like looking back on what we know now, Brody was probably in rough shape at this point. And to, to get, you know, their kids and, and his wife away from that, to let them come and enjoy a show and to have that, it just shows you the type of people that Tony Khan, you know, the, the, the AEW is. Because if they weren't, I mean, you know, and, that, and that's one of the things too, I'll, I'll break the fourth wall here. You know, I had contacted Conrad about using some of the what happened when audio because Tony Schiavone, um, I'm tearing up thinking about it. Um, some of the stuff that he said just shows you the type of company that AEW is and how they treated his family. And that's why I, I wanted the audio. Um, Conrad never got back to me. Um, you know, he's a busy guy, you know, whether or not he does get back to me down the road, whatever, it's fine. I, you know, I, I didn't necessarily expect him to, but, um, it would have been cool if he gave us the okay to use it. I mean, we're not trying to make any money off it. So I, you know, I don't, I don't see the harm in it, but I also didn't want to piss off the pod father essentially. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, how else can you look at it knowing what we know now? Yeah. It's just a reminder, you know, not to get all sappy here, but just, tell your friend, f- friends and family that you love them as often as you can, because uh, you never know. <laughs> well, and that, you know, the, the situation I had, you know, I, it woke me up to the people that I, I need to make sure. No, I mean, I, like I said, I said this before, but on the air, I've, I've said, I love, you know, love you to, to people that I never thought I would just because it's weird or it might be socially unacceptable or whatever. But um, you realize the people that you do care about, the people that care about you in a situation like this, AEW, all the people have done what they've done. They are um, saints in my book for the way they've treated this situation. I agree. I think, and they signed this, you know, Brody Lee Jr. to a contract. So when he's 18, he can work for them in some capacity. And it's kind of nice that they're still letting the family have some financial security. So that's one less thing they have to worry about. And that's, it shows that if you look at wrestling as an employer, we could always have an employer that treats employees as well as they do. Yeah. Well, and then the TNT championship, they're going to redesign it, but no, nobody else is going to wear that title now. Yeah. So that, that's cool too. I mean, they didn't have to do that. They could have just kept right on along. And, um, but they felt that because, you know, because Brody was gone, that this is the best way they could show their appreciation for what he did for the company. I would agree. So that's, you know, we did the best we could to kind of, you know, capsulate the career of John Huber, Brody Lee, Luke Harper, um, you know, best that we could. I think we did, we got through this episode, you know. Yeah, it's probably a little bit longer of our episodes, but yeah. I, mean, I feel like this episode had to, you know, I texted you guys with the idea. I'm like, I think we have to do a Brody show. I, I think we have to. Um, and as sad and as long as this episode is, and I apologize to our fans that are used to shorter episodes, but um, you can't cut this short. It can't be. Uh, a proper episode without what you know what we talked about you know, he, you know i i wish i could go back in time and appreciate him more when i did you know because it's one of those things where he was gone too soon and i like the wyatt family maybe i didn't you know pay as close attention to them as i will but i wish i'd go back in time and watch him more next and watch his rise and like tim said you never know when your time's up so yeah. whether it's saying goodbye to your friends. I mean, sorry, saying you love you to your friends and family or just enjoying the moment. Like I wish I could have gone back and enjoyed more of his career, but that's why I'm thankful we have the network and we have, you know, YouTube. So I can still watch some of his content and realize like we, you lost a good one. Well, and it just shows you like, you know, that especially with AEW having, you know, Eric Redbeard come in and giving him that moment, 
they didn't have to do that. I mean, he doesn't even work there. Yeah. They, but they care enough about the people that were impacted by John Huber. And clearly Eric Rowan was somebody that was impacted by what, what, you know, and the fact they had him do the run in, they had him come back out with the sign. He's blubbering like a, a friggin' you know, idiot out there showing, showing you how much he cared about this person that just passed away. And that was one of the moments where I lost it. You know, I, like I said, it, it, there was a lot of times during that show, but for to see this big burly bearded man come back out with a sign and he's blubbering like like you know his both his parents just died in a car accident you know if he was like six you know he's up there just i mean losing his mind and it's like man you don't realize until it's too late you really you really don't no I, that that and like i was saying off air you know when they put the boots in the ring just oh, everything dude. about everything about that show just it just Right when you thought, okay, I can appreciate the show, I can enjoy the show. Nope, you you just had more onions being cut. You just had more emotions filling your body. After the main event, they said they were gonna they have the, the the tribute to Brody. I'm like, wasn't this show a whole tribute to him? I'm like, oh no. I'm like, this is gonna be worse. Like for tears, like this isn't good. I don't have very many left, man. <laughs> and um, you know, the video package was was fantastic. It was cool. They had so many. The coolest thing about the package, they had so many WWE people in the pictures because they were personal pictures of the Huber family. So there's nothing WWE can do about it. Yep. Because in the picture, just because it's Big E doesn't mean it's Big E. It's a personal picture. There's nothing you can do about it, Vince. And so I, um, hopefully he doesn't try because that will not look good on him at all. No, <laughs> there's, there's nothing you can do legally. There's no, you know, and that's why they showed all those pictures. Those are personal pictures and they belong, you know, just, you know, he's not promoting, they're not promoting their characters to just, we know who they are because yeah. of, you know, to, you know, some of the people in those pictures, we didn't know who they were, but it was just cool that, they included all these pictures from all the people. And, and you know what I noticed is that the people that were in those pictures that still worked at WWE were the people that wore the armbands on Raw and SmackDown for a reason, because that those are the people that appreciated and had the love for Brody, um, and he had it for them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, just, you know, our thoughts and prayers go to the, the Huber family. Uh, one more time, go to shopaw.com and buy okay. the uh, – Brody Lee uh, memorial shirt or tribute shirt. Again, all the proceeds go to the, his family. Yeah, we got through it. Uh, I think we did a really good rundown yeah. of his career and did it justice. So, <laughs> well, and th that was the more important thing is I didn't really care how factually correct we were. I just really wanted to let people know, um, you know, that this man, you know, lost his life and and left his family behind. And uh, he touched a lot of people in the business, not in a pervy way, um, but in a sentimental, you know, it, it's it's just crazy to think, like we said, in, in the beginning of October, he was out there having one of the best matches that AEW's ever had. And two and a half months later, he's gone. So it's um, it's crazy. It is. Uh, coming up for you guys uh, next week, we're kind of going to get back to our normal type of programming. We're going to go to uh, New Year's Resolution uh, 2006. That took place uh, about 14 years ago. Um, so looking forward to dissecting that, uh, dissecting that peer review and, you know, get back to normal with our normal format here. Tim just did the uh, Lance Storm. If we can be serious for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, it, it should be good, um, you know. And then the next show after that, we have sold out ninety nine coming at you. Like like Tim said, um, you know, we we've got some decent shows coming up for you guys. The cards on them are really solid. Uh, thanks for bearing with us for this show. Uh, we we couldn't do it any justice compared to what AEW did, but we had to at least try. So. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up for you guys in the coming weeks. Thanks for bearing with us for this uh, extended uh, episode. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Take care. We'll be back next Saturday at 5. Until then, I'm Tim Kurt. I'm Roland Fulis. And I'm Mongo. And this is Wrestling with Wrestling's Past and Present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>